Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Keflex or Cephalexin. This is an antibiotic that was discovered in 1967, first marketed in 1969, so it's pretty old. It's now available as a generic. It's on the World Health Organization list of essential medicines, fifth most commonly prescribed antibiotic in the United States, and the 107th most prescribed drug. It seems that it's the most popular of all of the cephalosporins, in Australia, it's among the top 15 prescribed medicines. But you have to remember, as an antibiotic, it frequently is prescribed for improper reasons. Estimated somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of antibiotics are not for appropriate indications. It's not for a viral infection. It's certainly not for a common cold, not for just the run-of-the-mill sore throat. It kills certain gram-positive bacteria. Those are bacteria like staph and strep. So it's good for strep pneumonia and staph epidermidis and the group A beta hemolytic strep. But there's a problem with increasing resistance because it's been used so much. It's useful against the methicillin susceptible staph, but not against the methicillin resistant staph or the MRSA you've heard so much about. And it also seems to kill some of the gram negative bacteria like E. coli or Proteus mirabilis or Klebsiella pneumonia. Well, cephalosporin is a big family of antibiotics. And the cephalexin, or keflex, is considered a first-generation drug. Now, there have been second and third and fourth and even fifth-generation drugs. They have different kind of spectrum of activity. But the first-generation cephalosporins, like cephalexin, well, they have an activity similar to the beta-lactam antibiotics. That means penicillin, basically. So it's bactericidal against a large number of organisms. It kills the bacteria. Some antibiotics just wing the bacteria or temporarily stop them from growing. Here in the case of cephalexin, it actually kills the organisms, but it's inactive against a wide array of bacteria. So it doesn't work against the anaerobes, against the bacteria that don't require oxygen, doesn't work against the fungi, doesn't work against the viruses, and the way it works is it prevents the cell wall from being replicated. Well, what's it good for? It's good for a lot of cases of otitis media, middle ear infection, skin and soft tissue infections, so cellulitis and abscesses. Can be used for certain forms of acne, can be used in pregnant women, breastfeeding women, can be used for respiratory infections like strep throat, even certain forms of pneumonia. It can be used to prevent bacterial infection of the heart valves after you go and see the dentist. Maybe not necessarily the first choice, but it certainly is one of the approved drugs that we use. It's good for certain back bone and joint infections, even for certain urinary tract infections, even for prevention of urinary tract infections. But you only take cephalexin if you highly suspect that you have a bacterial cause for whatever your problem is and that the bacteria is susceptible. And knowing whether the bacteria is susceptible requires some sort of knowledge of where you happen to get your infection. Because in certain locales, there's a high incidence of resistance. Other locales, well, it's much lower. So have to know that kind of information. For certain kinds of infections, it's even important to get a culture and sensitivity. It takes about 48 hours to get the answer from that and then, depending on what the outcome is, maybe the antibiotic needs to be changed. The good news about cephalexin is it doesn't interact with uh, drug metabolizing enzymes in the liver, so that means it has fewer cross-reactions than with other drugs that we take. Get higher blood levels after using the cephalexin compared to most of the other antibiotics. And the other good news is only about 10% of the antibiotic is bound to the proteins. Well, that means that 90% is free and active in the system. So the more the binding is to the protein, the lower the action is. So here we have some good news on two fronts. Well, it's available in capsules and tablets, even in oral suspension. It comes in 250 milligram, 500 milligram. Those are the standards. It also comes in 333 and 750 milligram. And the way it works is it prevents something known as peptoglycan from forming a stable cell wall. 
so that as the bacteria starts to grow, it sort of bulges out the cell wall and then lets some of the tissue fluid in that bursts the bacteria. So that's pretty good news. So effectively, it puts holes in the cell wall of the bacteria. That's the way it kills it. Well, what's the likelihood of an allergy? We talk about antibiotic allergies. Is there much in the way of allergy to cephalexin? No, not really. It's very low. But actually, more of a problem is that somewhere between 1 and 10 percent of people who are penicillin allergic can have an adverse reaction to cephalexin. Probably the number is closer to 1, 2, or even 3 percent. It's not an issue with the second and the third and the fourth generation cephalosporins, but it is with the first generations. So if a person has a mild to maybe even a moderate penicillin allergy, it's probably okay for the most part to use it, because most people actually who think they're allergic to penicillin really aren't. But if you had a severe reaction to penicillin, then cephalexin is not an appropriate substitute. Well, if you have an allergy to the cephalosporin family, then again, you probably shouldn't take it. What about the side effects? Are they common? No, actually, they're not very common. Overall, probably about 3% of people have some sort of drug-related adverse reaction. We look at gastrointestinal problems like diarrhea, and nausea, and vomiting, and dyspepsia, or GI upset, all less than about 1 or at most 2% abdominal cramps, relatively uncommon, again, less than 1%. 1% or fewer people are going to suffer from anemia, or rash, or urticaria, or headache. But some women might develop a vaginitis or genital yeast infection, even a genital itch from overgrowth of other bacteria. Sometimes it can lead to an unpleasant taste in the mouth, and it happens to come in a relatively large capsule, so some people might find it difficult to swallow. Now, we know that Cipro and that family tends to cause some problems with the tendon, and so too cephalexin may rarely cause a problem with the tendons. It can increase the number of eosinophils, those are the allergy cells, and sometimes, on rare occasion, when people take the medicine, then they have an increase in some of the liver enzymes that we find in the bloodstream. And on prolonged use of the drug, we can have overgrowth of bacteria that aren't susceptible to the antibiotic. We call that a superinfection. Well, one of the worst problems that we have nowadays with the antibiotics is a problem with C. difficile, Clostridium difficile. It's a bacteria, and it's possible to get a growth of this particular organism in the intestine when you take any antibiotic. It can happen with Keflex or Cephalexin, but it's not all that common. But it's an important one to realize. And it can occur during treatment or even up to about two months after you discontinue the drug. It has a wide range of symptoms from mild diarrhea to fatal colitis. The diagnosis needs to be considered in anybody who takes an antibiotic and then develops some diarrhea or symptoms of colitis or toxic megacolon or even has perforated colon. Cephalexin alters the bacteria that are present in the intestine. Obviously, it kills bacteria wherever they are, and sometimes that leads uh, an opening so that the Clostridium difficile that might already be there starts to grow. And as it grows, it makes certain kinds of toxins, toxin A and B, and they contribute to what we now call Clostridium difficile associated disease, and that can be refractory to antibiotics, to other antibiotics. So here we have a potential life-threatening disease. So what do we do? Well, early on, if it's just a mild diarrhea, just stop the antibiotic. If it's a moderate diarrhea, then you need some support, you need some fluid and electrolytes and protein supplements, and you need antibiotics directed specifically against the Clostridium difficile. However, if it's a really severe problem, that's when they do those fecal transplants. Could you overdose on the medicine? Sure, but it doesn't usually cause much problem. Typically, you're going to develop some nausea or vomiting or epigastric distress, maybe even a little bit of diarrhea. Otherwise, 
if you take it and you have other kinds of symptoms, probably it's due to underlying disease state or maybe even an allergy or sometimes a toxicity from other kind of medicine. Rarely ever does it need any kind of treatment. Pregnancy by itself doesn't appear to cause any specific issues with cephalexin or keflex, breastfeeding again, appears relatively safe. There's no alteration in fertility. You have to be a little bit cautious as renal function deteriorates, either because of disease or over the course of a lifetime as your, what we call glomerular filtration rate, which normally should sit in an uh, average young person over 90. Well, in a person about 65, it might be 60. Well, when it gets down to about 30, we have to restrict the amount of cephalexin we use you could have a possible false positive test for glucose in the older tests that aren't used anymore, but not with the test tape that we use frequently. With the drug, the total amount absorbed, same with food or without food, but you get a higher peak blood concentration if you take it without food. Now, it's going to go through the kidneys and it's going to go through the filtration mechanism of the kidney, and that means it's going to have the peak concentration in the urine. So if we use just a 250 milligram capsule of cephalex and keflex, we're going to have 1,000 micrograms per milliliter in the urine. Now compare that to just 9 to 32 micrograms per milliliter in the blood, and you can see that we really concentrate the medicine in the urinary tract. So it's good for urinary tract infections, whether they're kidney infections or bladder infections. That's why it's a really good choice, even when the drug might not seem to be appropriate because of supposed resistance. Oftentimes it works just because it's a massive quantity. Well, the drug's well absorbed. The peak concentration's within about an hour. Protein binding is only about 10%. It's not metabolized or inactivated by the body. The elimination half-life is about an hour but it can be increased to somewhere between 8 and 14 hours in people who have renal failure. 80% of the medicine is going to be excreted within about 6 hours after you take it. How much should you take? All depends on what kind of condition you have. But the typical dose would be about a gram a day in divided doses. Maybe you take it two times a day or three or even four times a day could be increased, if necessary, to two grams, even up to four grams. If you need more than four grams, then you should consider either a different antibiotic or the drug needs to be administered parenterally by shot. Children, well, they take the dose based on how much they weigh. The maximum peak blood concentration, you're going to get it if you take the drug on an empty stomach, but it's acid-stable in the stomach. But food in the stomach delays the peak, delays the onset of action, and prolongs the blood level. Actually, you're gonna get about 10% less excreted in the urine if you take it with food rather than if you take it fasting. And if you're taking it with it for a urinary tract infection, obviously you want the highest concentration you can get in the urine. Well, the renal excretion of the drug is going to be slowed down if you take another medicine called probenicid. Probenicid is used for gout typically. So if you're taking the medicine, then you gotta be a little bit careful of combining the two. It also increases the blood concentration of cephalexin. Alcohol is gonna decrease the absorption from the intestine if you take it with metformin, very commonly used. It's gonna increase the concentration of metformin in the system by about 30%. If you take it with a drug like cimetidine or ranitidine, it can decrease the absorption of cephalexin, so you get lower blood levels. It's a beta-lactam antibiotic, so we find that bacteria frequently make uh, beta-lactamase. When you make beta-lactamase, it in effect breaks down the cephalexin. Cephalexin doesn't work. And the bacteria also can make another kind of a substance that pumps the antibiotic out of the bacteria. And obviously the bacteria, the, this antibiotic doesn't work. Well, the precursor to the cephalosporin family was something called cephalosporin C. It was found from the fermentation of Emerycellopsis minimum. That's a fungus. Originally, it was called Cephalosporium acrimonium. 
and it was discovered in 1945 in the sea near a sewage outlet off the coast of Sardinia. The structure of the antibiotic was elaborated in the early days, 1953 to about 1961. It sort of served as a starting point for a variety of semi-synthetic compounds. Other first-generation cephalosporins include Doricef and Ancef and Cephadil and Velocef, all in addition, of course, to Keflex. Now, it's similar in action to the amoxicillin and the penicillin family in general, but unfortunately, over time, an increasing number of bacteria are becoming resistant to all of these antibiotics. Now, as I mentioned, we have the fourth generation and the fifth generation. Fifth generation has a novel spectrum of activity against those methicillin-resistant staph aureus. How much does all of this cost? Well, the good news is that generic cephalexin, generic cephalex, very inexpensive. You can get 40 tablets of 500 milligrams. If you just pay cash, it's only $31. If you have a coupon, it's between $10 and $20. You get the coupon free at GoodRx. If you take the Keflex, the name brand, even though it's been around for a long time, it's still going to cost you more than $400 if you pay cash, and if you have a coupon, it's going to cost you about $370. So cephalexin, it's the generic for Keflex. It's a pretty good antibiotic, good for minor bacterial infections for staph and strep and middle ear infections, sometimes strep throat, urinary tract infections, relatively few side effects and low cost. But because of the overuse of antibiotics, and remember 40 to 60 percent of antibiotics, that's probably a minimum, are inappropriately used, so now we have a condition where a lot of bacteria are becoming resistant to the effect. And remember, as with all antibiotics, they're only good for susceptible bacterial infections. They're not good for viruses or the common cold. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend and consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.